Hey, welcome to Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We're Carly and Zach, and we're so glad you're here with us today. But today on the podcast, we actually have a very special, super special, my most special guest, uh, Yasminka Kladzic, who is a professor at the University of Windsor and like, I don't know, my personal life hero. I think everybody who knows me is quite sick of me talking about how great I think she is all the time. She is guest reading for us today, which is super exciting. She's going to read the 2020 class action decision of Park and Novingsham. I don't think I said that right, but it's close. Uh, it's useful because it covers sort of the basics of your class action. So if you don't know anything about class actions, this is the case for you. She also does, quite frankly, the most amazing, adorable introduction ever. It literally says in my notes that I made for me and Zach, her introduction is adorable. It's literally adorable. So <laughs> I'm sorry. I stand her so much. It's so embarrassing. But anyway, uh, we hope you enjoy. Ismik is going to take it from here and do a sort of full explanation on what we're looking at. So Enjoy. Hello, I'm Yasminka Kalajic, an Associate Professor of Law at the University of Windsor, where my primary research area is class actions. I also teach class actions. And before becoming a professor, I was a class action litigator. So you might say that I come by my nerdy obsession with class actions, honestly. I'm really pleased to be participating in the Legal Listeners podcast And I'll be recording a case called Park and Nongshim, a 2019 decision of Justice Glostein of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice. Now, you may wonder why this case. It's not well known. It's not particularly sexy. It didn't result in a multi-million dollar settlement. But I think it is indicative of a great number of cases that are started litigated, and ultimately settled to not much fanfare in Ontario. For law students and lawyers wanting to learn about class actions, it's also a really great case because it succinctly sets out the relevant leading authorities on a whole bunch of issues relevant to class actions. It's a consent uh, certification motion, so you'll hear a little bit about what are the factors that a court considers in certifying a case. It's a partial settlement, so you're going to hear about what happens when there is an agreement uh, to cooperate with the plaintiff by a settling defendant as against non-settling defendants. It's, of course, an approval hearing for a proposed settlement, so you're going to hear about the test for Uh, determining whether a settlement is fair, reasonable, and in the best interest of the class. It's a fee approval motion, so we'll cover that law. It's also a motion to discontinue the action as against a particular defendant. There is an order approving a CPRE payment, so the law on CPRE is covered. And finally, there is an unsuccessful request for an honorarium payment to be made to the representative plaintiff, so that law is covered as well. So it really is a smorgasbord of class action uh, nuggets of knowledge that I think provides a really good survey of some of the basics in the life of a class action. But it's also an interesting case for a few other reasons, and so if you'll allow me to Um, provide a little bit of analysis. You'll find out that in this case, the notice of the proposed settlement was widely distributed using all kinds of media. And I think that that really does indicate that there's a new standard for providing notice in the province. And that's a really good thing. But in that notice, that first notice of the proposed settlement, The judge specifies that how the funds are going to be distributed was not disclosed in the notice. It does get set out in the second notice after the settlement has been approved, but it did make me pause. If the purpose of the first notice is to alert class members that there is a proposed settlement and this is their opportunity to object if they don't agree with it, then wouldn't the way in which the funds are going to be distributed be a really important detail, something that should be set out in the notice. 
Another thing that stood out is that Justice Gluestein is joining a few other judges like Bello Baba and Strathy in approving an approach to the uh, uh, approval of council fees that says there is a presumption that a one-third contingency fee is going to get court approval. And they do so because, in part, they say that's just standard. That's commonly what uh, lawyers get in class actions. In fact, the empirical data doesn't bear this out. There have been a number of studies by Benjamin Alari, who's a professor at U of T, where, in fact, the median amount for uh, counsel fee is significantly less than one-third. And the bigger the class action settlement, um, the smaller the percentage to be should be uh, in light of the fact that, you know, a really big fee may be out of all proportion to the effort expended by counsel. So it is interesting that we now have at least three judges in the province who are committed to this, you know, presumption of a standard one-third contingency fee. It's not an approach shared by all judges in Ontario, so it will be interesting to see um, whether that approach um, gains favor among the judiciary in the years ahead. Something else that I want listeners to think about as they hear the decision is to query how might the new provisions in the amended Class Proceedings Act affect both the certification analysis as well as uh, the CPRE distribution. There are now, for the first time, explicit provisions in the CPA about CPRE and a presumption, or a default, if you will, that the monies will go to legal aid in Ontario. Will this impact a judge's assessment of who is an appropriate recipient in future cases? And finally, what I find really interesting is that this is a price-fixing case, and like so many other price-fixing cases, the judge admits that there is, quote, no cost-effective way of locating the class members. So we know this at the outset of a price-fixing action. It will be, most likely, impossible to identify and locate the class members who will ultimately get the benefit of any settlement or trial judgment. And so it is known at the outset that the most likely outcome if it is successful, is that there will be a sum of money paid by the defendants that is distributed see prey. And I don't think that that's a bad thing. I think it furthers the deterrence function of class actions. But it does suggest that at least for this type of litigation, class actions are not about compensation at all. And that raises, I think, some really interesting normative questions about whether it's appropriate to be using private litigation to effectively create a civil fine for defendants who are allegedly um, in breach of the Competition Act. Anyway, think about those things as we go ahead and hear about Park and Nongshim, a decision of Justice Gluestein in 2019. Julie Park is the plaintiff, and the defendants are a variety of companies, all of them with Korean names, Nongshim Co., Nongshim America, Otogi Corporation, Otogi America, Samyang Foods, Korea Yakult, and Paldo Co. Limited, all defendants. It was a case decided by Justice Glostein of the Ontario Superior Court of Justice in Toronto. The case was heard on March 26, 2019, and written decision, written reasons for decision were released uh, just a few days later. Reasons for decision. Nature of motion and overview. The plaintiff, Julie Park, brings this motion pursuant to the Class Proceedings Act for an order to one, on consent, certify the action against the defendant Samyang Foods Co. for the purposes of settlement. Two, on consent, approve the settlement of this action with Samyang in accordance with the terms of the settlement agreement signed on November 25, 2017. 
This is what we call hereafter the settlement agreement. Three, on consent, approve the dismissal of this action as against the defendants Nong Shim Ko, hereafter Nong Shim Korea, Nong Shing America, Atogi Corporation, hereafter Atogi Korea, Atogi America, Korea Yakult, hereafter Yakult, and Paldo Co. Collectively, the non-settling defendants. Four, on consent, approve the payment of class council fees and disbursements. Five, on consent, approve the payment of a $500 honorarium to park. And finally, six, on consent, approve the proposed CPRE distribution of the remainder of the settlement funds in equal shares to the Law Foundations of Ontario and British Columbia. There is a companion case in British Columbia, Cosma et al. v. Nong Shim Ko, which is being case managed by Justice Funt. Similar relief was granted by Justice Funt in Cosma on March 15, 2019, but it is contingent on the Ontario court also granting matching orders. At the hearing, I granted the relief sought except for the payment of the honorarium to Park. Park provided three draft orders to the court at the hearing. I signed the first order dismissing the action against the non-settling defendants. I signed the second order certifying the action as against Samyang and approving the settlement agreement. I requested that counsel provide a revised version of the third draft order setting out the quantum of the proposed distribution of funds, as well as removing the term ordering payment of an honorarium. I granted the above relief by endorsement dated March 16, 2019, with reasons to follow. I now set out my reasons below. Facts. This class action concerns allegations that the defendants engaged in a conspiracy to fix the price of instant ramen noodles manufactured by the defendants or their subsidiaries or affiliates, hereafter Korean noodles, sold in Canada. A. Related Korean and U.S. Proceedings The class action was brought in light of certain Korean and U.S. proceedings, which I review below. 1. Korean Proceedings On or about July 12, 2012, the Korean Fair Trade Commission, KFTC, issued an order holding that the Nongshim Korea, Samyang, Arukgi Korea, and Yakult, collectively the Korean defendants, had each conspired to fix, maintain, raise, and or stabilize the price for Korean noodles sold in South Korea. The KFTC found that 1. the Korean defendants had increased the price for their respective Korean noodles at the same time and to similar levels at least six times between May 2001 and February 2010. 2. There was never any obvious disruption or interruption in the Korean defendant's conspiracy to increase the price of Korean noodles. And 3. The Korean defendant's conspiracy was continuous and repetitive. The 2012 KFTC order enjoined the Korean defendants in South Korea from committing anti-competitive acts by collaboratively deciding the price for Korean noodles and exchanging pricing information regarding Korean noodles. The 2012 KFTC order required the Korean defendants to pay penalties totaling approximately 136.3 billion won, approximately 120 million US dollars, as follows. 1. Nongshim Korea was ordered to pay approximately 108.1 billion won in penalties. 2. Samyang was ordered to pay approximately 12.1 billion won in penalties. 3. Autogi Korea was ordered to pay approximately 9.8 billion won in penalties. And 4. Yakult was ordered to pay approximately 6.3 billion won in penalties. Samyang announced on July 17, 2012 that it was excused by the KFTC from paying the penalty because it had voluntarily reported the price-fixing conspiracy to the KFTC to avail itself of the KFTC's leniency program. Nongshim Korea, Arogi Korea, and Yakult appealed to the Seoul High Court seeking to vacate the penalties imposed by the KFTC. On November 8, 2013, 
The court upheld the KFTC's ruling as against Nongshim Korea and Autogi Korea. On December 4, 2013, the court upheld the KFTC's ruling as against Yakult. On December 24, 2015, the Supreme Court of Korea overturned the High Court's decision upholding the KFTC corrective actions and penalties. After the Supreme Court's ruling, the KFTC published a decision on January 28, 2016, revoking all corrective actions and penalties related to the 2012 KFTC order against the Korean defendants. 2. U.S. Proceedings On July 22, 2013, a class action was filed in the United States District Court Central Division of California Western Division called the Plaza Company v. Nongshim Company Limited and uh, Nongshim America Inc. et al. The action was brought on behalf of all persons who directly purchased Korean noodles in the United States from May 2001 to present. The claim refers to the 2012 KFTC order. Various other actions were also brought for both direct and indirect purchasers of Korean noodles. Both the direct and indirect purchaser actions were consolidated as INRI Korean Ramen Antitrust Litigation in the Northern District of California and to be case managed by Judge William Oreck of the U.S. Federal District Court in the Northern District of California. On August 12, 2016, national settlements in the United States were reached with Sam Yang in both the direct and indirect purchaser actions. These settlements provided for substantial cooperation from Sam Yang as well as cash payment. The settlements mirror the proposed settlement with Sam Yang in Canada. With respect to other claims in the United States, by reasons dated January 19, 2017, Justice Oreck granted certification in a contested motion against Nongshim Korea, Nongshim America, collectively the Nongshim defendants, Autogi Korea, Autogi America, collectively the Autogi defendants, and Yakult, the U.S. non-settling defendants. On December 28, 2017, Justice Oreck dismissed motions for summary judgment brought by the Nongshim defendants and the Autogi defendants. Yakult was no longer a party to the action at that time. A class action jury trial against the Nongshim defendants and the Autogi defendants commenced on November 13, 2018. The jury reached a verdict on December 17, 2018, and the decision of the court was released on January 11, 2019. The Nongshim defendants and the Autogi defendants were successful, as the jury found that the U.S. plaintiffs failed to establish a price-fixing conspiracy. An application for a new trial was made by the U.S. plaintiffs and was set to be heard on April 10, 2019. However, the U.S. plaintiffs agreed to abandon their appeal in exchange for the defendants waiving their costs. B. History of the Current Action The COSMA action was filed on behalf of a proposed class of British Columbia residents in August 2015. The Ontario proceeding was filed on June 20, 2017. Klein Lawyers is class counsel on both actions. The action in British Columbia was filed before the 2012 KCTF order was overturned in South Korea and was also filed prior to the settlements reached in the U.S. with Samyang. In 2016, after the settlement with the Samyang was approved in the U.S., the plaintiffs in Samyang sought negotiation of a similar deal in Canada. As British Columbia was not an opt-out jurisdiction, class counsel brought the present class action in Ontario to assist for settlement purposes. After months of arm's length negotiation, a settlement agreement was signed on November 25, 2017, which included both the British Columbia and Ontario actions. In the recitals of the settlement agreement, Samyang states that it has agreed to enter into the settlement in order to avoid the expenses, risk, and burden of further litigation to obtain the releases, orders, and judgment contemplated by the settlement agreement, and to put to rest with finality all claims that have been or could have been asserted against it in the British Columbia and Ontario actions. A hearing before this court was held on November 15, 2018 for approval of the form of notice to the class, 
providing information relating to the proposed hearing for certification and settlement approval. Class Council provided the court with the proposed notice program prepared by Crawford Class Action Services. The notice program was approved. It was also approved by the court in British Columbia and parallel orders were granted. On November 14, 2018, the Nongshim defendants served Park with a motion for summary judgment seeking to dismiss the claims against them based on the statute of limitations. The motion was not set down as later events led to the proposed dismissal of the action without costs against the non-settling defendants. The class action jury trial in the U.S. started after the hearings in British Columbia and Ontario approving notice of the consent certification and proposed settlement. Class counsel followed the case closely. The verdict was released on January 11, 2019, and the U.S. plaintiffs were unsuccessful. Upon weighing the risk of pursuing the action in British Columbia and in Ontario, the plaintiffs and class counsel have determined that it is not in the best interests of the plaintiffs to continue this action against the non-settling defendants. C. The Settlement Agreement as noted above, the settlement agreement was signed before the verdict in the U.S. proceedings dismissing the action against the U.S. non-settling defendants. The key terms of the agreement are 1. Settlement Fund Sam Yang has agreed to pay $288,586.98 as the settlement amount to be held by class counsel in an interest-bearing trust account until a distribution of such funds is approved by the court hereafter the settlement fund. Two, cooperation, discovery, information, and documents. Sam Yang has agreed to cooperate with the plaintiffs in pursuing the claims against the non-settling defendants by assisting the plaintiffs to obtain documents, discovery, and information from Sam Yang that were part of the actions in Korea as well as the United States. Additionally, the settlement agreement includes access to information stored on a hard drive held by Sam Yang pursuant to an agreement in the U.S. proceedings. Three, access to witnesses such as current or former employees of Sam Yang. The plaintiffs will be able to obtain information from a witness regarding Sam Yang's submission to the KFTC in connection with the KFTC's investigation of the Korean noodles industry. Sam Yang will provide witnesses such as current or former employees to attest to the authenticity of documents as well as the veracity of the content of U.S. deposition transcripts for use in the Canadian actions. 4. Releases and dismissals and effect of the settlement. Upon the settlement agreement becoming effective, the British Columbia and Ontario actions will be dismissed as against Sam Yang with prejudice and without costs. Sam Yang will receive full and final releases from the settlement class upon the date the agreement becomes effective. 5. Bar order. Bar orders shall be sought from both the British Columbia and Ontario courts, preventing the claims for contribution and indemnity by the non-settling defendants against Sam Yang. 6. Certification for settlement purposes only. The actions shall be certified as class proceedings as against Sam Yang solely for purposes of settlement of the actions and the approval of the settlement agreement by the courts. For the Ontario action, the proposed settlement class is defined as all persons in Canada, excluding British Columbia, who purchased either directly or indirectly Korean noodles during the class period, except for any excluded person. The class period means May 1, 2001, to December 31, 2010. And the proposed common issue is, did the settling defendant, Sam Yang, conspire to fix, raise, maintain, or stabilize the price of Korean noodles in Canada during the class period? 7. Notice to Settlement Class. The settlement agreement provides for two notices to the proposed settlement classes. The first notice is for the proposed certification for settlement purposes as well as the application for settlement approval. The second type of notice is either notice of approval of the settlement agreement or, in the alternative, if the settlement agreement is not approved, terminated, or fails to take effect, the proposed settlement classes will be given notice. Costs of the notices shall be paid from the settlement fund. 8. Opting out. 
If a potential settlement class member does not wish to participate in the settlement, such person must opt out of the actions in accordance with the settlement agreement. Samyang reserves all of its legal rights and defenses as against the person who opted out. 9. Class Council's Fees and Disbursements The agreement states that Class Council disbursements and Class Council fees shall be reimbursed and paid solely out of the settlement fund and that Class Council may seek approval contemporaneous with seeking approval of the settlement agreement. 10. Administrative Expenses all administrative expenses are to be paid out of the settlement fund. This includes costs of notice to the class. And finally, nine, sorry, 11, <laughs> funds remaining in the trust account. If there are any funds remaining in the trust account after the payment of class council disbursements, class council fees and administrative expenses, class council shall seek direction from the courts on the distribution of the remaining funds. D, the notice program. 1. Notice of the Hearing Objections Under the first phase of the notice program, notice of this proposed certification and settlement, as approved by this court, has been published. The notice program was implemented by Class Council with the assistance of Crawford Class Services. Class Council retained Crawford Class Action Services, who arranged the digital banner notice, print publications, and the press release portions of the publication. The digital banner notice effort began on January 7, 2019 and was completed on February 3, 2019. The advertisements appeared on Google, DoubleClick, Sysmec, and Yahoo Audience Network in English, French, and Korean, as well as social media advertising on Facebook and Instagram in English for a total of approximately 35 million impressions. Combined, the ad networks cover nearly 90% of the Canadian population. According to Crawford Class Action Services, the ads ran on thousands of websites including yahoo.com, huffingtonpost.ca, foodnetwork.ca, koreatimes.net, accuweather.com, canada.com, tsn.ca, torontosun.com, lapresse.ca, and many more. Ads ran in English, French, and Korean. Newsfeed notices ran across Facebook and Instagram, top social networking sites in Canada. Combined, they include over 20 million active users in Canada. Ads ran in English, on Facebook, and Instagram. Print publications were affected by publishing a short-form notice which appeared in a quarter-page advertisement in Korean in the Van Chosun, Vancouver, on January 7, 2019, and the Korea Times Daily, Toronto, on January 14, 2019. The press release was disseminated on January 7, 2019 over PR Newswire's National Canadian Bilingual Newsline in French and English. The release was issued broadly to a network of over 2,400 major media, industry, trade, regional, and sector websites. In addition, all news releases and multimedia are posted to the newswire.ca website which receives the highest number of Canadian monthly unique visitors and referred search traffic in the industry. The notice was published by several media outlets, including Canadian Business Journal, Globe Advisor, Automobile Association of Canada, and AutoOpinion.ca, among others. The approved court notice was posted on Class Council's website on December 10, 2018, and remains posted on the website. To date, Class Council has not received any objections. 2. Notice of Settlement Approval and Right to Opt Out The settlement agreement provides that a second notice program will be implemented should the case be certified and the settlement approved. Crawford Class Action Services has agreed to do Phase 2 of the notice program. The program provides the same level of notice that was issued in Phase 1. Crawford has provided a proposal and cost estimate at $41,277.16. 3. Notice of Distribution of the Settlement In addition to the approval of the settlement agreement, certification against Sam Yang for settlement purposes, and dismissal of the action against the non-settling defendants, Class Council also seeks approval of its fees and disbursements, payment of an honorarium of $500 to park, and a distribution of the remaining funds in equal shares to the Law Foundation of British Columbia and the Law Foundation of Ontario. 
While details of this proposed distribution were not included in the published notice about this hearing, an application for fees was expressly contemplated in Section 13 of the Settlement Agreement. Class Council proposes that the details of this distribution be included in the second notice. Analysis. I address below each of the issues set out at paragraph 1. In my prior decisions in CAS and Western on 2018 ONSC 4794, here and after CAS, and in Ali Hold Co. v. Archer Daniels Midland Company, 2019 ONSC 131, here after Ali Hold Co., I addressed the law relevant to many of the issues raised in this matter. I rely on those reasons where applicable below. Issue 1. Certification of the action against Samyang for settlement purposes. In CAS, I reviewed the applicable law and held, at paragraphs 44 to 46, under Section 5.1a, the Court applies the same standard of proof as on a motion to strike a cause of action. The facts as pleaded are assumed to be true and the requirement is satisfied unless it is plain and obvious that the plaintiff's claim cannot succeed. For the remaining certification requirements, the plaintiff must establish, quote, a minimum evidential basis for certification order, end quote, by, quote, showing some basis in fact for each of the certification requirements, end quote, referring to paragraphs 24 to 25 of Hollick. The court must be satisfied that all of the requirements for certification are met, even when certification is sought for the purposes of settlement. However, the requirements quote, need not be as rigorously applied in a settlement context, end quote, given the different circumstances associated with actions which have reached settlement, and because the manageability of the proceeding is not an issue. Under Section 5.1a, the pleadings disclose a cause of action against Samyang. The alleged conspiracy is set out with the required particularity, identifying one, the impugned acts to allegedly suppress and eliminate competition in the Korean noodles industry and to increase or maintain the prices of Korean noodles, two, the alleged conspirators, three, the nature of the Korean noodle market, four, the dates of the alleged conspiracy, and five, the damages suffered. Under Section 51B, there is an objective class definition proposed which identifies all those who may have a claim, who will be bound by the result of the litigation, and who are entitled to notice. The class is defined by objective criteria without reference to the merits of the action. The proposed class of, quote, all persons in Canada, excluding British Columbia, who purchased either directly or indirectly Korean noodles during the class period, except for any excluded person, end quote, for the proposed class period between May 1, 2001 to December 31, 2010, meets the above test. In CAS, I summarized the applicable law for the requirement under Section 51C of a proposed common issue at paragraph 65. Quote, the proposed common issue is necessary to the resolution of each class member's claim and a substantial ingredient of those claims, referring to Hollick at paragraph 18. Allowing the suit to proceed as a representative one will avoid duplication of fact-finding and legal analysis, meeting the low bar required for this aspect of Section 5, end quote. The proposed common issue of whether Sam Yang conspired to fix, raise, maintain, or stabilize the price of Korean noodles in Canada during the class period is necessary to the resolution of each member's claim and is a substantial ingredient of those claims. The determination of the issue would avoid duplication of fact-finding and legal analysis. In CAS, I summarize the applicable law for the requirement under Section 51D of a preferable procedure on a settlement approval motion at paragraphs 67 to 69. Quote, a class proceeding is the preferable procedure for the resolution of the common issues in an action when it is a fair, efficient, and manageable method for advancing the class member's claims and is preferable to other means of resolving the class member's claims. In considering preferability, a court is to adopt a practical cost-benefit approach to consider the impact of a class proceeding on class members, the defendants, and the court. Further, where there is a cause of action, an identifiable class, common issues, and a settlement, there is a strong basis for concluding 
that a class proceeding is the preferable procedure because certification would serve the primary purposes of the Class Proceedings Act, namely access to justice, behavioral modification, and judicial economy. The proposed class action against Sam Yang is the preferable procedure as it serves the goal of access to justice. It would not be preferable for each class member to bring an individual action for the limited amount of damages incurred by each class member. The cost of such litigation would be prohibitive. A class action would provide a fair, efficient, and manageable method to advance the class member's claims. Under Section 51E, I find that Park is an appropriate representative as she has a common interest with other class members and has no conflict of interest. She has vigorously prosecuted the claim to date. Certification in price-fixing cases has been ordered by the courts both on a contested basis and on a consent basis for settlement purposes. For the above reasons, I certify the action as a class proceeding as against Sam Yang for settlement purposes as per the endorsement. Issue 2, Approval of the Settlement Agreement. A, the applicable law. In CAS, I set out the applicable law on the test for approval of a settlement agreement in a class action at paragraphs 85 to 90. Quote, in Parsons and Canadian Red Cross Society, Winkler J., as he then was, set out the applicable legal principles relevant to the court's assessment of reasonableness of a settlement agreement at paragraph 69 to 80. First, the test for approving a settlement is whether, in all of the circumstances, the settlement is fair, reasonable, and in the best interests of the class as a whole, not whether the settlement meets the demands of a particular class member. Second, the court should not engage in a dissection of the settlement with an eye to perfection in every aspect. The settlement need only fall within a zone or range of reasonableness, which is an objective standard which allows for variation depending on the subject matter of the litigation and the nature of the damages for which the settlement is to provide compensation. Third, in determining whether to approve a settlement, the court may take into account the following factors. A, the likelihood of recovery or success. B, the proposed settlement terms and conditions. C, the amount and nature of discovery, evidence, or investigation. D, the future expense and likely duration of litigation. E, the recommendation of neutral parties, if any. F, the number of objectors and nature of objections. G, the presence of good faith, arm's length bargaining, and the absence of collusion. H, the degree and nature of communications by counsel and the representative plaintiff with class members during the litigation, and information conveying to the court the dynamics of and the position taken by the parties during their negotiation. And I, the recommendation and experience of counsel. These factors are and should be a guide in the process and no more. Indeed, in a particular case, it is likely that one or more of the factors will have greater significance than others and should accordingly be attributed greater weight in the overall approval process. And finally, class action settlements must be seriously scrutinized by judges. The function of the court in reviewing a settlement is not to reopen and enter into negotiations with litigants in the hope of improving the terms of the settlement. It is within the power of the court to indicate areas of concern and afford the parties an opportunity to answer those concerns with changes to the settlement. However, the court's power to approve or reject settlements does not permit it to modify the terms of a negotiated settlement, referring to the Dabbs decision of 1998. Quote, evidence sufficient to decide the merits of this of the issue is not required because compromise is necessary to achieve any settlement. However, the court must possess adequate information to elevate its decision above mere conjecture, end quote, referring to Ontario New Home Warranty Program and Chevron Chemical Co., a 1999 decision of the Superior Court of Justice. The parties proposing the settlement have an obligation to provide sufficient information to permit the court to exercise an objective impartial, and independent assessment of the fairness of the settlement in all of the circumstances. It is not necessary that examination for discovery has occurred at the time of the settlement. Settlements reached at an early stage of proceedings are appropriate. 
There is a strong initial presumption of fairness when the settlement is negotiated at arm's length and recommended by class counsel. Similarly, Sharp J, as he then was held in Dabbs and Sun Life Assurance Company at paragraph 32, quote, the fact that this settlement is strongly recommended by experienced counsel is certainly a factor in its favor. The recommendation of class counsel is clearly not dispositive, as it is obvious that class counsel have a significant financial interest in having the settlement approved. Still, the recommendation of counsel of high repute is significant. While class counsel have a financial interest at stake, their reputation for integrity and diligent effort on behalf of their clients is also on the line." End quote. I now review the above factors based on the evidence on this motion. B. Application of law to the evidence. The likelihood of recovery or the likelihood of success. In the present case, the settlement agreement was reached before the recent U.S. trial decision dismissing the claim against the U.S. non-settling defendants. On the evidence before the court, the settlement agreement, when reached, enhanced the class's chance of success. It remains beneficial for the class after the U.S. proceedings. The settlement was reached before documentary discovery of any of the defendants. The settlement provides funds and substantial cooperation from Samyang in the continuing litigation as against the non-settling defendants. This assistance reduces time, costs, and provides access to information, facilitates evidence from witnesses, and provides documents for use in the common issues trial regarding the conspiracy that might not otherwise be available to the class. I agree with Park's submission that actions involving price fixing are complex, and the allegations of conspiracy in this case against the defendants span many years. Most of the events regarding the alleged conspiracy occurred in Korea. Having to deal with evidence in Korean in an action proceeding in a Canadian court adds even more complexity to an already difficult case. Settlements with one or more defendants exchanged for cooperation are not uncommon in price-fixing cases. It provides a tactical advantage to the class as it can simplify the litigation by reducing the number of defendants and also providing invaluable information. In Osman and Cadbury Adams Canada Inc., Strathy J, as he then was, approved a similar settlement between the plaintiff and two of the alleged conspirators in a chocolate price-fixing scheme. Strathy J noted the, quote, important and immeasurable non-pecuniary benefit and the inestimable value, end quote, of a settlement with one defendant, quote, in a conspiracy action where the allegation is that the defendants share a dark secret, obtaining the cooperation of two of the alleged conspirators to assist the plaintiff in pursuing the alleged co-conspirators, end quote. Another benefit of the settlement at the time it was reached is that it could have increased the prospect of success of reaching a settlement with the non-settling defendants. The settlement agreement could have served as a catalyst for other non-settling defendants, encouraging them to settle with the plaintiff rather than being drawn into lengthy litigation. The litigation in the United States provides a clear example of drawn-out court proceedings with mixed results for the parties. The U.S. plaintiffs were successful on certification and on the motion by the Nongshim defendants and Otogi defendants for summary judgment. However, Yakult was successful in being removed as a defendant. Further, the U.S. plaintiffs lost a jury trial and agreed not to pursue an appeal in exchange for an agreement by the Nongshim and Otogi defendant not to pursue costs. After the unsuccessful U.S. Jur trial jury verdict, the risks associated with continuing litigation against Samyang have increased. If a trial based on conspiracy amongst the U.S. non-settling defendants could not succeed, there would be little if no basis to support a conspiracy claim against Samyang. It is unlikely that Samyang would approach the plaintiffs with any form of settlement at this point in time. Two other relevant factors. I summarize the other relevant factors supporting approval of the settlement agreement. One, the settlement provides financial compensation in circumstances where the U.S. plaintiff's action was dismissed against the U.S. non-settling defendants and resulted in significant costs, which were only not pursued in exchange for the agreement by the U.S. plaintiffs to abandon their appeal. Two, class counsel is experienced in class action litigation and recommends the settlement. 
1953, at the time that this partial settlement was negotiated, it was difficult to estimate how long this litigation could last. The assistance provided by Sam Yang, particularly with document discovery and access to witnesses, would have substantially expedited the plaintiff's preparation for trial. Four, on August 22, 2016, settlements were reached between the direct and indirect purchasers in Sam Yang in the United States. These settlements mirror the one proposed in this action. The settlements were approved by Judge Oreck as they were found to be fair, reasonable, and adequate based on the complexity, expense, and likely duration of the litigation, the settlement class's reaction to the settlement, and the results achieved. To date, there have been no objections and there has been an extensive notice program. Six, the negotiations with Sam Yang were in good faith. They spanned many months and required significant advocacy on the part of plaintiff's counsel. While Sam Yang reached an earlier agreement with the U.S. plaintiffs which provided a model for the Canadian agreement, there were significant parts to the agreement which required adapting and expansion to suit the needs of Canadian litigation. And seven, the representative plaintiff was involved in this case and communicated with counsel throughout. As set out in her affidavit, Park met with her lawyers at various times, spoke with them on the phone, and corresponded with them by email. She was kept informed of the progress of the case in British Columbia and the United States. Based on the above evidence, I approve the settlement agreement. Issue three, approval of the dismissal of this action as against the non-settling defendants. In Ali Hold Co., I summarized the applicable law on a motion for approval of a discontinuance of an action under Section 29 of the CPA as follows. Section 29 sub 1 of the CPA requires court approval to discontinue a class action proceeding, even if the class action has not yet been certified. I summarize the relevant principles below. 1. In order to grant the discontinuance, the court must be satisfied that the interests of the proposed classes will not be prejudiced. 2. Consequently, the court can consider whether the chances of success in the litigation are risky or remote. 3. Court approval prevents the use of a discontinuance for an improper purpose. The court reviews a proposed discontinuance to ensure that it does not result in collusive or inadequate settlements, including the risk that the, a representative plaintiff can enhance his or her individual bargaining position, or counsel can use a discontinuance to sacrifice class members' interests for legal fees. Four, court approval for the discontinuance of a proposed class action deters plaintiffs and class counsel from abusing the class action procedure by bringing a meritless class proceeding to extract a payment as the price of discontinuing the class proceeding, and provides the court with an opportunity to ameliorate any adverse effect of the discontinuance on class members who might be prejudiced by the distribution. Five, a motion for discontinuance should be carefully scrutinized and the court should consider, among other things, whether the proceeding was commenced for an improper purpose, whether there is a viable replacement party so that putative class members are not prejudiced, or whether the defendant will be prejudiced. And six, the court can consider whether intervening events in the course of a class proceeding have caused the chances of success to become remote. I find no concerns as to improper use of the class action procedure in this case, nor any concerns of additional terms required to protect the interests of class members. Based on regulatory action in South Korea and related litigation in the United States, this litigation appeared potentially promising for Park until the trial verdict in December 2018. In light of that new information, it is now reasonable for Park to end her lawsuit. No payment has been sought from the non-settling defendants in exchange for this voluntary dismissal. In the present case, the settlement with Sam Yang was reached prior to the jury verdict in the United States. While a loss in the U.S. class action jury trial is not determinative of a Canadian outcome, the risks associated with this claim have increased. Even with the cooperation of Sam Yang, the U.S. plaintiffs were unable to prove that a price-fixing conspiracy existed. Consequently, it is unlikely that the non-settling defendants would have any incentive to consider a settlement with the class at this time. The plaintiffs in the British Columbia and Ontario actions face significant litigation risks at all stages of the proceeding. 
there would have been the potential for a contested certification hearing in more than one jurisdiction, which may have resulted in multiple appeals and inconsistent outcomes. There is a motion for summary judgment on limitation periods filed in the Ontario proceeding by the Nongshim defendants with the potential to spur on other similar applications filed by the other non-settling defendants. If certified, there would likely be an extensive discovery phase leading to a lengthy common issues trial also with potential for appeals. And in the end, the result could be that the price fixing conspiracy cannot be established based on the evidence. Park's dismissal with respect to her individual claim does not prejudice anyone else who might still want to pursue a claim. In addition, there is no evidence of any abuse by Park or by counsel. To the contrary, I find that they are acting in good faith and in the best interests of class members by choosing not to pursue the action against the non-settling defendants. Consequently, I approve the dismissal without costs of the action against the non-settling defendants. Issue 4. Approval of Class Council Fees and Disbursements I reviewed the applicable law for approval of Class Council Fees and Disbursements in CAS at paragraphs 117 to 26. The Class Council Fees are to be approved on the basis of whether they are fair and reasonable in all of the circumstances according to Parsons and Lefrancois. The courts in Lefrancois and in Silver set out the following factors which may be considered by the court when determining whether class counsel's fees are fair and reasonable. One, the factual and legal complexities of the matters. Two, the risks assumed in pursuing the litigation, including the risk that the matter might not be certified and the risk of loss at trial. Three, the opportunity cost to class counsel and the expenditure of time in pursuit of the litigation and settlement. Four, the amount in issue. Five, the result achieved. Six, the importance of the matter to the class members and to the public. Seven, the degree of responsibility assumed and the skill and competence demonstrated by class counsel. Eight, the ability of the class to pay. And nine, the expectations of the representative plaintiffs, the class and class counsel as to the basis for calculating fees and the amount of fees. An agreement to make a contingent payment on the basis of a percentage of a settlement or recovery is contemplated by the word otherwise in section 32 sub 1 sub c of the CPA and has often been awarded. Contingency fee arrangements are an important means to provide enhanced access to justice to those with claims that would not otherwise be brought because to do so as individual proceedings would be prohibitively uneconomic or inefficient. Similar to a multiplier, a contingency fee retainer gives the lawyer the necessary economic incentive to take the case in the first place and to do it well, and as such, that opportunity must not be a false hope. The policy of the CPA is to provide an incentive to class counsel to pursue class actions in order to increase access to justice. Class counsel fees have been awarded and are intended to compensate law firms for the risk that they may never be paid for their time or reimbursed for their disbursements. In Parsons too, Justice Winkler as he was then stated, the legislature has not seen fit to limit the amount of fees awarded in a class proceeding by incorporating a restrictive provision in the CPA. On the contrary, the policy of the CPA as stated in Gagne is to provide an incentive to counsel to pursue class proceedings where absent such incentive, the rights of victims would not be pursued. It has long been recognized that substantial counsel fees may accompany a class proceeding." End quote. In Crown Bay, Winkler J. commented on the benefits of a contingency fee in class actions to encourage settlement. Quote, on the other hand, where a percentage fee or some other arrangement, such as that in NADA, is in place, such a fee arrangement encourages rather than discourages settlement. Fee arrangements which reward efficiency and results should not be discouraged." End quote. Similarly, in Osman and Cadbury Adams, Canada, Strathy J., as he then was, endorsed contingency fee arrangements in class actions. He held at paragraphs 21 and 22, quote, There is much to be said in favor of contingent fee arrangements. Litigants like them. They provide access to justice by permitting the lawyer, not the client, to finance the litigation. They encourage efficiency. They reward success. 
They fairly reflect the considerable risks and costs undertaken by class counsel, including the risk that they will never be paid for their work, the risk that their compensation may come only after years of unpaid work and expense, and the risk that they will be exposed to substantial cost awards if the action fails. Effective class actions simply would not be possible without contingent fees. Contingent fee awards serve as an incentive to counsel to take on difficult but important class action litigation. In my respectful view, courts should not be too quick to disallow a fee based on a percentage simply because it is a multiple, sometimes even a large multiple, of the mathematical calculation of hours docketed times the hourly rate." End quote. In Abdul Rahim and Air France, Strathy J, as he then was, approved a one-third contingency fee referring to it as, a, as standard in class action litigation. He held at paragraph 13, quote, a contingency fee of one-third is standard in class action litigation and has been commonplace in personal injury litigation in this province for many years. It has come to be regarded by lawyers, clients, and the courts as a fair arrangement between lawyers and their clients taking into account the risks and rewards of such litigation. Fees have been awarded based on such a percentage in a number of class action cases." End quote. In Canon and Funds for Canada Foundation, Justice Belobaba also approved a one-third contingency fee and held that there was a presumption that such arrangements are valid and enforceable, provided that they are, quote, fully understood and accepted by the representative plaintiffs, end quote. He held in canon at paragraph 8, quote, What I suggest is this, contingency fee arrangements that are fully understood and accepted by the representative plaintiffs should be presumptively valid and enforceable, whatever the amounts involved. Judicial approval will, of course, be required, but the presumption of validity should only be rebutted in clear cases based on principled reasons, end quote. In canon, Justice Bellobaba provided examples of clear cases where the presumption of validity could be rebutted, which included, one, where there is a lack of full understanding or true acceptance on the part of the representative, two, where the agreed to contingency amount is excessive, and three, where the application of the presumptively valid one-third contingency fee results in a legal fees award that is so large as to be unseemly or otherwise unreasonable. End quote. I apply the above principles to the present case. I find that there is no basis to rebut the strong presumption of validity of the contingency fee arrangement. I rely on the following factors. One, when the action started, there was considerable legal uncertainty as to whether this claim would be successful. Consequently, class counsel undertook risks to pursue the action. Two, a conspiracy claim based on alleged conduct in Korea is factually and legally complex. Even if the Korean and U.S. proceedings had been successful, significant work would have been required by class counsel to pursue the claims in the British Columbia and Ontario actions. Three, class counsel obtained significant benefits for the class through the settlement agreement. Four, the agreed to contingency amount is not excessive, and five, the application of the contingency fee does not result in a legal fees award that is so large as to be unseemly or otherwise unreasonable. For the above reasons, I approve the fee agreement and the fees disbursements and taxes sought by class counsel. I fix legal fees at a total of $107,739.14, being $96,195.66 for fees plus applicable taxes of $11,543.48 and disbursements at $128,047.16 inclusive of taxes. Consequently, the total of legal fees and disbursements including the $2,000 for honorarium ordered by Justice Fund for the four British Columbia plaintiffs is $237,786.30. Issue 5. Approval of Honorarium for Park. The Applicable Law. The payment of honorarium to representative plaintiffs in Ontario for class actions is exceptional and rarely done. In Baker Estate and Sony BMG Music Canada, Strathy J, as he then was, conducted a thorough review of the case law 
and held at paragraphs 93 to 95, quote, the payment of compensation to a representative plaintiff is exceptional and rarely done. It should not be done as a matter of course. Any proposed payment should be closely examined because it will result in the representative plaintiff receiving an amount that is in excess of what will be received by any other member of the class he or she has been appointed to represent. That said, where a representative plaintiff can show that he or she rendered active and necessary assistance in the preparation or presentation of the case, and that such assistance resulted in monetary success for the class, it may be appropriate to award some compensation. The Court of Appeal has recently indicated in Smith Estate versus National Money Mart that any compensation paid to the representative plaintiff should normally be paid out of the settlement fund and not out of class counsel's fee to avoid concerns with respect to fee splitting. It is interesting to note that on certification motions, the court is often concerned to ensure that the representative plaintiff is truly engaged in the litigation and is not a mere bench warmer or straw man recruited by class counsel. Courts have frequently commented on the need to have an active and involved plaintiff who will be familiar with the proceedings, instruct counsel, monitor settlement discussions, and generally act as any private client would in supervising his or her own litigation. A private client would normally receive indirect compensation for such efforts out of the proceeds of settlement or judgment. A representative plaintiff normally will not. That being said, these are contributions the court expects a representative plaintiff to make, and I respectfully agree with the observation of Hoy J. in Bel Air v. Dea that compensation should not be awarded simply because the representative plaintiff has done what is expected of him or her. It should be reserved for cases like Garland and Enbridge Gas Distribution, where the contribution of the representative plaintiff has gone well above and beyond the call of duty." End quote. In Robinson and Rochester Financial, Strathy J. again refused to order an honorarium. He summarized the factors for the court to consider at paragraph 43. Quote, in this particular case, while I acknowledge the contribution made by Catherine Robinson and by Rick Robinson, and commend them on the work they have done to bring this matter to a successful conclusion on behalf of their fellow class members, I am not prepared to award such compensation. In my respectful view, requests for compensation for the representative plaintiff are becoming routine, as Sharp J. anticipated in Windesman. I agree with those who have expressed the opinion that compensation should be reserved to those cases where, considering all the circumstances, the con contribution of the plaintiff has been exceptional. The factors that might be appropriate for consideration could include a. The active involvement in the initiation of the litigation and retainer of counsel. b. Exposure to a real risk of costs. c. Significant personal hardship or inconvenience in connection with the prosecution of the litigation. d. Time spent and activities undertaken in advancing litigation. e. Communication and interaction with other class members. and f. Participation at various stages in the litigation, including discovery, settlement negotiations, and trial. End quote. The exceptional nature of an honorarium is even more circumscribed in a CPRE settlement where there is no monetary success for the class. Winkler J., as he then was, held in Sutherland and Boots Pharmaceutical at paragraph 22, quote, while the work of the representative plaintiffs is commendable, to compensate them for their work when the settlement funds for the entire class are being donated to research without a single penny finding its way into the hands of a class member, would be contrary to the precept of a Cypre distribution in particular and to a class proceeding generally. Compensation for representative plaintiffs must be awarded sparingly. The operative word is that the functions undertaken by the representative plaintiffs must be necessary. Such assistance must result in monetary success for the class and in any event, if granted, should not be in excess of an amount that would be purely compensatory on a quantum merit basis. Otherwise, where a representative plaintiff benefits from the class proceeding to a greater extent than the class members, and such benefit is as a result of the extraneous compensation paid to the representative plaintiff, rather than the damages suffered by him or her, there is an appearance of a conflict of interest between the representative plaintiff and the class members. A class proceeding cannot be seen to be a method by which persons can seek to receive personal gain over and above any damages or other remedy 
to which they would otherwise be entitled on the merits of their claims. This request is denied." End quote. B. Application of the law to the evidence. There is no evidence to support the payment of an honorarium. In Robinson, the representative plaintiffs filed evidence that they each spent more than 300 hours to assist class counsel. Such work did not meet the exceptional requirements set out by Justice Strathy as the factors he set out did not apply. In Sutherland, each of the four representative plaintiffs spent on average 100 hours of time for which they kept detailed records. Those plaintiffs were not awarded an honorarium, as Winkler J. held that apart from research that they conducted, the other tasks of meeting with counsel, reviewing options, providing instructions to counsel with respect to proposals and counterproposals, and meeting amongst themselves to evaluate their position and develop strategy are those expected to be undertaken by almost all representative plaintiffs. In Baker, no honorarium was ordered despite the evidence of the representative plaintiffs Quote, their affidavits indicate that they were extensively involved in settlement discussions, correspondence, telephone conversations and meetings, and review of settlement documentation. Mrs. Baker, who lives in England, was required to travel from her home in Cornwall to London for cross-examination on her affidavits, end quote. In light of the above case law, Parks filed no evidence as to any exceptional circumstances justifying an honorarium. Her evidence is only that, quote, I provided information for the statement of claim and reviewed it. I have met with my lawyers various times, spoken with them by phone, and corresponded with them by email, and they have kept me informed as to the progress of this case and related cases in British Columbia and in the United States. I discussed the details of the Samyang settlement with my lawyers and consent to the settlement." End quote. The above evidence is not sufficient to award an honorarium based on the case law reviewed above, and I dismiss the request for this relief. Issue 6. Approval of a CPRE distribution of the remaining settlement funds equally to the Law Foundation of Ontario and the Law Foundation of British Columbia. The Applicable Law. In CAS, I set out the following principles relevant to court approval of CPRE settlements at paragraph 91. Quote, CPRE settlements have been ordered by the court where, one, it is not practical to distribute the benefits in any other manner, Two, a direct distribution to the settlement class would be uneconomic considering the modest damages and the fact that there is no cost-effective way of locating the settlement class members, determining if they suffer damage, and if so, establishing their loss. And three, the CPRE distribution is directly related to the issues in the lawsuit and will directly benefit people in similar circumstances to the class members. In Ali Hold Co., I added at paragraph 47, Quote, I also rely on the following principles relevant to CPRE distribution as set out by Perel J. in Slark v. Ontario. One, a CPRE distribution must be fair, reasonable, and in the best interest of the class. Two, a reasonable number of class members who would not otherwise receive monetary relief must benefit from the order. C, CPRE distributions are generally intended to meet at least two of the principal objectives of class actions. They are meant to enhance access to justice by directly or indirectly benefiting class members, and they may provide behavior modification by ensuring that the unclaimed portion of an award or settlement is not reverted to the defendant. Four, a CPRE distribution should be justified within the context of the particular class action for which settlement approval is being sought, and there should be some rational connection between the subject matter of a particular case, the interests of class members, and the recipient or recipients of the CPRE distribution. And five, a CPRE distribution should not be used by class counsel, defense counsel, the defendant, or a judge as an opportunity to benefit charities which, with which they may be associated or which they may favor. To maintain the integrity of the class action regime, the indirect benefits of the class action should be exclusively for the class members. Application of the law to the facts of the present case. In the present case, Park proposes that a CPRE distribution of the balance of the funds be made equally to the Law Foundation of Ontario and the Law Foundation of British Columbia. I find that it is appropriate to order the CPRE payment to the Law Foundations given their role in promoting consumer rights and access to justice. After deduction of $237,786.30, 
for the legal fees, disbursements, and British Columbia honorariums set out at paragraph 83 above, there will be $50,800.68 remaining in the fund. As in Sirhan, it is not practical to distribute the balance of the funds to every shareholder since, quote, it would be uneconomic considering the modest damages, which are even less than in Sirhan, and there is no cost-effective way of locating the settlement class members, determining if they suffer damage, and if so, establishing their loss, end quote. Further, allocating the net settlement funds to the Law Foundation is directly related to the issues in this litigation, since future consumers will benefit from education as to their legal rights and potential legislative reform based on the work of the Law Foundations. Consequently, I find that the CPRE payment is appropriate. Order and Costs For the above reasons, I grant the relief sought except for the request for an honorarium. Council may send me a revised third order, which incorporates the specific distribution ordered and the dismissal of the honorarium request. Thanks for the listen, friend. I hope you're able to enjoy that case and learn something new from it. Legal Listening is founded by Zach Battiston and Carly Lyons. It is hosted by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and you, our listeners. Executive produced by Zach Battiston, Carly Lyons, and Anthony Rademeyer. Audio engineering by Anthony Rademeyer. Graphic design by Julie Lundy. Check her out online at julielundyart.com. And music done by Matt Rademeyer at radandkel.com. At Legal Listening, we're always open to new ideas, suggestions, and of course, guest readers. Check us out on Twitter at Legal Listening or online at legallistening.com. Legal Listening, where audio obiter is our thing. We'll catch you in the next case. Bye now.